Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with a really important episode with somebody who I've been dying to talk to because he works really hard um, studying animals and animal welfare and trying to do better by our animal friends. Uh, we've got Professor Andrew Knight. How you doing, Professor? I'm struggling with uh, being in the English winter right now. I'm originally from Australia, uh, from some of the best beaches in the world, and I'm actually quite cold uh, and and trying not to be miserable uh, at this very moment due to the storms raging uh, outside my window. How are you doing, Chris? Same, same. I'm in the European climate right now, and it's just a little too nippy for my own well-being. Um, so, but you actually spent some time, so you came from Australia, came to, now you're in the UK, but you also spent time in the Caribbean. How did you get to the Caribbean? And well, why, and why didn't you stay? <clears throat> yeah, um, I often ask myself this very same question, <laughs> but um, I randomly got called by the dean of the world's second largest vet school and um, basically, um, to cut a long story short, she requested I come out to interview for a new faculty position out there and I had no prior academic experience and I thought this was a mad idea. I uh, wouldn't possibly be offered uh, the position, but I wasn't going to say no to a free trip to the Caribbean and uh, they were going to put me up at a resort and everything. So I gladly got on a plane uh, and uh, immediately turned up at the tail end of a, a Caribbean uh, hurricane that had flooded uh, half the island and the island before it. And that was all very strange initially. Um, but the resort hotel was fantastic. I had a great time out there. And then I was horrified after the end of two days to actually be offered the position, which had never been in the plan. Um, and all of a sudden I had to stop and actually start taking the whole thing seriously. And, and it, it occurred to me that they'd gone to actually a significant time and, and uh, expense to, to fly me out here and put me through two days of interviews. And uh, I owed it to them to, to seriously consider this, this position. Um, I ended up taking the position I never thought that I would be eligible for because I wasn't an academic. I was a practicing veterinarian. Um, and indeed, an, an animal advocate. Uh, I started off campaigning against uh, the live sheep export trade in Perth, West Australia. I was all involved in all sorts of uh, animal advocacy campaigns. So going into the heart of the establishment, working for academia, was uh, a most odd thing. And on top of that, it was a privately owned for-profit uh, university. It was the, the heart of the corporate empire. So I felt uh, extremely um, uh, <laughs> opposite to what I was used to. So um, I did uh, end up taking the position, had all sorts of incredible adventures uh, in the Caribbean for a couple of years, uh, saw an awful lot of sea turtles, uh, a lot of wonderful things, but a lot of um, disturbing things as well. The standards of animal welfare uh, for the animals are often very low and for the uh, local people often not good either. It's a developing country, um, uh, St Kitts, where I, I stayed. Um, so there was a real place of contrast uh, and some exciting adventures. There was a volcano there and we would go hiking up over the rim down into the volcano, uh, having all sorts of um, adventures involving health and safety violations that wouldn't have ever been allowed uh, in the modern world. Um, and after a couple of years, I got offered the position, position to come to the University of Winchester, one hour south of London, and set up a new centre for animal welfare at the university. Um, this was an opportunity to actually focus just on animal welfare because I couldn't do that in the veterinary school where I was. I was able to get little bits of it into four places in the curriculum and previously there was none. Um, but I wasn't able to set up entire degrees just on animal welfare. So that's uh, a re really interesting point. You say you were a vet and, and because of the status quo of the education on animals, you weren't seeing the ball get moved forward at all. So you decided to move into research. Did you um, have... Do you find that it's it is normal within academia or within the veterinary practices that there are just outdated and, and unethical practices? The um, veterinary schools set the culture of much of the profession. They're seen as leaders of the profession, and veterinary schools get a lot of money from um, intensive the intensive farming industry uh, and the animal research industry. So. People that work uh, with and for those industries um, are a very um, powerful group within veterinary schools and the money coming in from those industries 
I think compromises their ability to seriously critique uh, those industries and the practices that go on in those industries. Um, so, so there is there is uh, this conflict of interest. Actually, the veterinary profession ought to take more uh, proactive positions, trying to advance and advocate for the welfare of animals in society at large. And society quite rightly expects vets to be leaders on animal welfare issues. But actually, when I surveyed uh, the positions of uh, the national and international veterinary associations some years ago and compared them with the positions of general society on a range of key animal welfare issues, I found that vet associations were commonly behind those of the general public, not um, leading those of the general public. Um, so I think that this um, is because of the um, compromise of um, the values of the veterinary profession that's going on because of uh, all the money coming to veterinary schools to support um, research uh, uh, from those those industries and vet schools are somewhat dependent on on the, those funding sources mm-hmm. and um, the, the financial uh, conflict of interest that is going on. It's interesting that... Um, there's this huge um, conflict between uh, doing what is best for animals and doing what the paying client is asking for if the paying client is the the owner of a, a, an intensive livestock farm or a set of racing horse stables um, or a um, laboratory animal research facility. So vets are in this in- interesting position where they are supposed to be putting the welfare of animals first, but actually the person that's paying the bills is asking them to condone or engage in practices that are compromising the welfare of animals. And amazingly, this is very little spoken about, very little recognised, and yet I think it's a giant elephant in the room, to be honest. I can't think of another profession where there's such a massive conflict of interest between doing the right thing that the professional is supposed to be doing and someone who's paying the bills who wants them to undercut that. Yeah. And so that's when we start talking about what, which we love to talk about corporate malfeasance on this show and, th- you know, rag on capitalism for the profit motive and what it does. But you touched on something about live exports where is it true that you'll have a ship full of millions or you know thousands and thousands of uh, animals and you'll have maybe one vet and he's basically just paid to look the other way yeah um one of my classmates when i went through veterinary school was dr lynn simpson uh and she became one of australia's most experienced uh long-haul livestock veterinarians Uh, she i think sailed in about 57 long-haul voyages and she was requested to do a report on the animal welfare problems that she was seeing on on the ships. And you're right, there are up to and above 100,000 sheep that can travel on these massive ships up to 14 storeys high. Um, And the conditions on board are often quite terrible, um, very dependent on things things like uh, ventilation systems. And when there are failures, mechanical failures, Remembering that this is actually the oldest uh, maritime fleet in the world, and the average age of these ships is about 30 years. Um, when there's a failure, it means that thousands of sheep will die, um, not just two or three. Um, so disasters um, and all sorts of serious welfare problems are very common uh, on these ships, unfortunately. So she prepared uh, an animal welfare report describing with photographs uh, the terrible conditions that are common and the impacts for the welfare of the sheep. Um, this was released um, on into the public domain uh, in Australia uh, by somebody, um, we still don't know who, um, and it was picked up by the mass media over there and resulted in primetime uh, television coverage uh, in Australia, a huge national scandal. That's, uh, and that's it, rare. The mainstream media will pick it up, you know. Yeah. The, the result that is that the industry went to the government and said, in light of this, we can no longer work with this person. So the government did not say, we are the regulators and the overseers, it's up to us who we send on board these ships. Instead, the government basically said, well, you're the industry, you get to tell us what we do in our regulation of of your sector. If you don't want this person to be the appointed inspector, then fine, we will fire her. Um, that's effectively what occurred. So she lost her job. So she became one of Australia's best-known whistleblowers uh, in the animal uh, advocacy movement. 
Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask her on the show right after we get done here. Fantastic. Uh, I knew that when I interviewed you, I'd be shaking my fist a lot. Um, so let's 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 talk about this new study that you you did this year, which is really exciting and a little bit lighter of a topic. Uh, this is about you you did a little stuff. Well, I'll let you say it. this is about vegan diets for cats and dogs. Okay. That's right. For the last couple of years, I've been involved in this this sort of massive research project with um, multiple parts to it and looking at vegan cat and dog food. And uh, the one we published earlier this year attracted huge interest. Um, we published the first large-scale study of health outcomes in vegan dogs versus meat-based dogs. Um, and we have more than 2,500 dogs in this study, so a very large-scale study, meaning that results are pretty uh, statistically reliable. Uh, you can extrapolate them to all dogs with a high degree of scientific confidence. Uh, we found the healthiest and least hazardous diets for dogs were nutritionally sound vegan diets. Um, and there has been another study that's come out um, since then by um, scientists in Canada um, who found that previously owned vegan dogs lived on average one and a half years longer than meat-based dogs, um, which is like uh, a human being living around about an extra decade at the end of their lifespan. And on top of living longer, they seem to be living better, better quality of life because they seem to be having less problems of being overweight, mobility disorders, uh, arthritic uh, pain, and also uncomfortable conditions such as itchy skin, inflamed skin, uh, ear problems. They seem to be living longer with better quality of life as well, which makes sense if you provide a diet that's formulated to supply all the nutrients that are needed, but without the dietary hazards, which is, I think, more common in the commercial meat-based diets. And so vegan diets are, are notorious for being something that you have to be well, you well monitor your diet. And so the minute that you go vegan, that means you actually start focusing on your nutrients more closely than uh, before. And did so were there less instances of these uh, pets having to go to the vet for random unhealthy? Yeah. So in our study, we uh, looked at seven general indicators of health and one was how often the dogs needed to use medication, in other words, uh, whether they were going to the vet uh, more frequently, uh, and there were some other indicators that we were looking at as well. And we found that the, the dogs fed the vegan diets uh, seemed to be needing less medication, less veterinary visits, less use of prescription diets. Um, they had less um, cases of illness. Um, for the dogs that were ill, they were less likely to be severely ill or to suffer from multiple disorders at the same time. Yeah, so so all those sorts of benefits. And there have now been nine studies that as of late uh, 2022. There have been nine studies looking at health outcomes in dogs and two in cats, and there are some more that are coming soon as well. And so far, the message is pretty clear and consistent. Um, if you look at the combined weight of evidence from all these studies, I think it's clear and overwhelming that the healthiest um, diets for dogs are nutritionally sound vegan diets and the evidence is also very strong in the case of cats hmm. and so this is always going to be a controversial topic with uh, because of our traditional thoughts and about these the kind of things has there been pushback from anybody uh, hmm. with with your research yeah initially I think everybody pushes back more or less because you know we have traditionally thought of some of these animals as being carnivores whether or not that's still strictly true for the modern domesticated house um, dog, for example. Um, but once you explain the basic biological principles, everybody gets it, everybody that I've spoken to, including the critics. And the basic principles are that if you, if you formulate a diet that contains all the nutrients that the animals need in a formulation that's digestible so it can get into the bloodstream and to the cells and palatable so the animals enjoy eating it, then you would expect to see um, animals being just as healthy or, in fact, healthier if the diets don't include dietary hazards, which are common in meat-based diets. Um, so that's what you need to do sort of um, when you're creating the diet. Biologically, it ought to work. If we look at the evidence from the large-scale studies of health outcomes, that's exactly what we seem to be look looking at. We seem to be seeing um, populations of dogs that are as healthy or healthier in some respects. Um, living longer, uh, according to the latest large-scale study from Canada. Um, so we are seeing what we would expect to see if we create diets which are nutritionally sound but with less dietary hazards. And that's what the responsible manufacturers are doing with the new uh, vegan dog foods and indeed cat foods that are being developed. Hmm. 
and good and good on them for good coming out and, and finally making better food because you know notoriously these uh, pet food companies have been using the lowest quality ingredients and, and so on and so forth and then uh, for everybody out there who doesn't know people like pedigree and purina they're actually buying up veterinary practices to get your dog sick and then turn around and sell you the cure uh, as far as that goes um, but this isn't even a new concept there has been infamous cases of animals that were were vegan and lived a long healthy life can you you talked about one of this one of these can you tell us about this uh, i think you're talking about the uh, lioness little tyke yeah indeed obviously not quite a cat but in the, cat. the broader yeah a big cat you would say so when i was first researching this topic some years ago i went searching through the literature um to look for evidence that um, vegan cats were less healthy because everyone seemed to assume that must be true I couldn't find any other than one study w where a diet was deliberately formulated to be deficient in potassium fed to cats for um, quite a period of time. And after that shock horror, they got potassium deficiency. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's just brilliant, some of these scientific minds that are at work on, on these projects and amazing how responsibly our, our people choose to spend, spend public funding. Uh, like Pavlov, Pavlov yeah. all over again. Right. I accidentally found a whole bunch of studies showing that animals maintained on meat-based diets long-term got all sorts of health disorders, but I couldn't find any studies apart from that one showing that uh, cats or dogs on vegetarian or vegan diets were suffering health problems. Um, and I also accidentally found this report of um, a very famous um, vegetarian um, cat, and indeed it was a big cat, called Little Tyke, uh, and it was an African lioness uh, that was orphaned and raised on an animal sanctuary in California in the 1950s, I think it was, by Georges and Margaret Westbo, who raised um, her with a lamb, a deer, and a swan, all of whom became her firm friends. She hadn't been raised roaming around the plains of Africa hunting game animals and didn't associate other animals as food. Um, and so she refused uh, all attempts to eat meat, so they raised on a double handful of cooked grains cho chosen for their protein, calcium, fats and roughage, um, half a gallon of milk and an egg. She wasn't vegan, she was uh, vegetarian. To safeguard the health of her teeth, uh, they gave her, she wasn't gnawing on bones, so they gave her a rubber gumboot with her favourite perfume sprinkled on and one of those would last about a month. Um, so the age of, ten th the age of uh, four, she was 10 feet, 4 inches long, um, she could run at uh, 40 miles an hour or 66 kilometers an hour, and she um, was um, brilliantly proportioned. And one of America's most experienced zoo curators said that she was the healthiest African lioness he had ever seen. At that point, they stopped worrying about the veterinarian's claims that she was going to get sick and die if she didn't eat any meat, and um, which was good because they had been trying really hard to to get her to eat some meat. And, and had to resort to posting a $500 reward for anyone who could succeed in getting who to eat some meat. And back in the 1950s, there was an awful lot of money, so many people tried to claim uh, that amount, and one was successful because he would refuse all attempts. Um, so that was uh, Little Tyke, the most famous um, vegetarian <laughs> cat. Um, that's, but that's uh, there incredible. have been others as well. If you search your literature, she's not the only one. And so we also have Bramble, who was a famous, infamous border collie and vegan icon who lived to be 20, he, 25 years old, I think. I think he was about 28. Um, really? So, yeah, he was vegan, apparently. And Lord knows what that would be in human terms. But uh, for, me, life, for me, too long. The average lifespan of a, of a normal dog seems to be about... Um, 12.6 years, and if they are a vegan dog, apparently it's 14.1 years, so that's an extra year and a half. Um, and Bramble was 28, so clearly there is scope for uh, great longevity in these dogs. And th this 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 beautiful dog ate lentils, as far as I uh, heard. So, well, there you go. And there should, you go. We should all be eating more lentils, I guess. <laughs> well, that's what's for dinner for me. That's for sure. Um, so obviously being vegans, something that we should be looking at a little more closely as human beings. I've f f recently turned. Um, how long have you been on the vegetarian side? 
Gee, uh, it seems almost back when dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to trying to think all the way back in a dim, dark mist of time when I was uh, still young. Uh, Seeing as I'm now 147, but maintained on, on a vegan <laughs> diet, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, it was 29 years ago, actually, that I went vegan. Yeah. Wow, wow! Yeah. So you're an OG, as they say. Um, so you're not wasting away. You you look fairly healthy. You're not all skin and bones. Uh, I, I do things like mountain marathons uh, occasionally. Well, there you go. For all the people out there that say, "Where do you get your protein from?" Yeah. Uh, I certainly don't, don't trouble myself uh, with trying to balance diets or going to any trouble. Just a, a simple, basic, uh, healthy diet. We routinely cook some kind of stir-fried vegetables with some kind of base such as pasta or rice or something like that and toss in um, one of the fake meat products. Um, not everyone likes them. I love them, uh, whether they be sausages or fish fingers or any of the other, other fake meat uh, products, patties, burgers, things like that. Yeah, uh, along with things like uh, vegan magnums, uh, which um, I've recently discovered, and that that has been a problem. Um, <laughs> my wife has sort of banned me from them. Um, you know, things used to be easier uh, a long time ago. There were no temptations. Um, it was literally just um, lentils and some some vegetables and fruit, and not much else. But now there are. You know, probably more than 10 types of vegan ice cream, endless types of gourmet vegan cheese, every kind of um, vegan dessert you can imagine. They're not all, all healthy either. Right. So it's no longer a given that if you're on a vegan diet, you'll absolutely be, be healthy. I had it a is possible had a now to, be, to eat vegan junk food, and that didn't exist a while back. Yeah, I had a friend go in and say, your cholesterol is through the roof. And she says, well, I don't understand. I'm vegan, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, there you go. It is. It is possible to eat bad things as a vegan, um, but you still do have to work um, at it if you want to be unhealthy, because it is harder for you if you're on a vegan diet to, to be unhealthy. Yeah. And if you're on a regular diet, yeah. the sugar is the last thing where you're not hurting animals, but you are hurting yourself pretty bad if you go ahead and have ten magnums a day. Yeah, I <laughs> never think it's, it starts to appear on the stomach. Um, oh, really? <laughs> and I don't. I don't get to do the mountain marathons nearly as often as I used to because I'm trapped behind a desk uh, doing research and and trying to do outreach about uh, animal welfare issues. So, yeah. um, so I do have to be careful and limit those vegan magnums. I'll tell you what I tell all my my hero friends who come out here. I say, you take care of yourself because we need you. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to fall off any mountains. Yeah, please. Um, so you got a uh, you've been published recently in the new science scientific what's it called new scientist new scientist I've got a copy right here I'm very it proud of it um, so this is all the research that uh, I've been doing on vegan pet food um, and this made it out into new scientist uh, in um, September of this year 2022 uh, major feature article so that's kind of a career career highlight for sure and you know helps to bring the work to a massive international audience so really pleased about that hmm. and then you also have a book yeah over there. Yep. so let's see that we, we published um this um short time ago so this is the routledge handbook of animal welfare which has been called sort of a bible of the animal <laughs> advocacy movement it's the first time we've brought together all of the animal welfare issues into a single textbook um so what are the animal welfare concerns associated with the farming of every kind of land species, fish, uh, all sorts of other animal use, uh, laboratory animal use, uh, entertainment, wild animals, companion animals, exotics, and zoos, and so on, um, along with coverage of animal law in major world regions, along with things like animal ethics, human behavioural change, communication, education, animal welfare assessment, um, new and emerging issues, climate change, um, biodiversity loss, uh, pandemics, antimicrobial use, connections between human health and animal health. So we've got 50 co-authors around the world who are usually experts at universities around the world, uh, three uh, co-editors, including myself, and we put the whole thing together into a single volume, uh, heavily scientifically referenced, so it's got everything that people might need if they want to quickly become an expert on any one of the, the issues. Um, and it's been designed really to help um, the animal advocacy movement globally to quickly 
and skill up to, to become an expert on full range of issues, have access to full range of, of scientific evidence to uh, support recommendations for change in policy and practice. Um, and also to help students studying this discipline uh, around the world, including in my master's program or want to become veterinary specialists in animal welfare. It maps to the curriculum of, of the uh, veterinary specialist uh, examinations in this area. Um, and we're going to publish the entire textbook open access um, on the internet so everyone will be able to access it for free uh, by the end of this year, 2022. If um, you want your own paper copy um, that is available, uh, of course, uh, by ordering through through Routledge um, and any bookseller, really, um, information about that book and where to order it, um, views and so on, uh, is at my own website, which is uh, andrewknight.info. And check him out. He's also down there at the University of Winchester. You can get in touch with him about anything that you're concerned about. I'm sure he's loves to be bothered. Uh, I don't use the word hero too much, but you are a hero. And, you know, maybe I need a T-shirt with your face on it just, to, you know, so I can <laughs> support what you do. Um, the last thing I want to ask you is what was your original introduction to being empathetic towards um, – to animals, what was the moment where you said, "Hey, these these things are special"? Yeah, look, I think, um, and thanks for your, for your kind words. It's, it's very kind, appreciate it, and appreciate you helping getting this work to to big audiences. It's so important to not bring about a better world. But look, um, my um, intro to all this was, I think, I think um, all children um, are empathetic toward animals, and this is. Um, beaten out of them as it were as, as they grow up um, I think they go through a process of inculturation where they absorb the culture that is around them so when I was eight I received um, a book about baby animals with lots of pictures of deer and other animals in forests and so on and I, I looked at them and thought oh these are lovely animals I'm not going to eat animals and I went marched up to my parents and said okay I'm going vegetarian uh, and they they smiled and thought okay no worries this will last about a week uh, we were nearly vegetarian anyway so it wasn't a big step so uh, happy to tolerate that uh, and it lasted you know 18 years or so after which I, I then went vegan so um, so it didn't go go away uh, I just stuck with it I, I guess uh, I was fortunate not to be in a really hostile home uh, toward the concept of vegetarianism it would have been much tougher then I think um, the excuse um, of not being in a good environment um, sort of um, only lasts uh, until the point where people are independent adults and beyond that, it's not an excuse anymore, actually. We all do have the um, ability to make the best choices we can for ourselves, our lives and, and the world around us. And um, these days in the, in the modern world, everybody more or less can go vegan uh, and probably have a great time doing it as well and eat the delicious array of, of um ever expanding desserts and other healthy foods that are appearing so you know if you didn't have a good environment when you were young um when you as soon as you can become independent then you, you, you can still make those choices for yourself and for your sake and the rest of the planet i would encourage everyone to do so yeah i always like to mention the three big reasons which uh there, there are many but good for the animals good for your health and good for the environment this go vegan guys what's the hold up exactly and good for your taste buds as well um not the most noble of reasons but increasingly uh it's such a, a fun thing to do it's the easiest way to convert people is to say taste this yeah <laughs> getting better all the time yeah on the menu tonight we're definitely going to have some delicious food with a variety of uh vegetables with you know and you can still have fun everybody salt you know you can you can have fun, but um, you won't ever look back is what yeah. I, I think is the idea. You'll feel better for it. You won't get um, bad feelings of having too too much sort of meaty stuff and uh, afterwards you people tend to feel lighter and have more energy and recover from exercise more quickly. That's the kind of feedback I get when I talk to people that have gone vegan recently. There you go. Well, we're going to have you back uh, maybe sometime next year uh, in the new year. And we're going to, because we've just started to scratch the surface of what you've done and, and what's more to come with you. So we're excited to talk with you again. Um, anything you want to add before we go? 
I guess if people want to um, learn more about vegan pet food, uh, get advice about transitioning their animals um, safely and um, learn more about the recent studies in this area, um, I'm collecting all that at a website, which is uh, sustainablepetfood.info. So that's the place to look. Okay. Well, we'll be checking that out and there'll be links in the description for everybody to check that out. Uh, Professor Andrew Knight, University of Winchester, wonderful, wonderful human being. Thanks for being here. Thank you for cheering me up and thanks for having me. Thank <laughs> you. Wave goodbye to everybody. Bye, everybody. Okay.